Hi, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and tonight on EWTN Live, we'll introduce you to an organization that works with people in regions around the world affected by extreme natural hazards, humanitarian crises, and armed conflict. But before we want to hear from the general, from that, we'll talk to the general manager of EWTN Radio. Mr. Jack Williams, about what's going on in Catholic Radio. Jack, how are you doing? I am fantastic, Father Mitch. How are you? Oh, fine. Any jitters? I'm not nervous. No, okay. Like you said before we came on, I ain't scared. All right. And so what is going on in radio? Well, you know, a lot's going on in radio, and I really wanted to, we haven't been together in several months. We've right. had a little bit right. of, a, of a hiatus here, and mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure everybody understands exactly what we offer to them at EWTN Radio and where they can find us. Mm -hmm. Many people probably don't even realize we have eight full-time, 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week playouts just from EWTN Radio. We've mm -hmm. got the original shortwave that Mother started back in 92, mm -hmm. English and Spanish. We've got this beautiful AM, FM network that has blossomed out of that shortwave mm -hmm. network in English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. You've got a whole mess of folks here from San Antonio where they've got a great Guadalupe radio network station that carries okay. our programming. A little shout out to Richard Reyna and the whole gang there in San Antonio at Guadalupe Radio. We also have a separate feed that goes to Sirius XM Channel 130, so you can get it with a Sirius subscription. Mm -hmm. We've got a playout called EWTN Radio Classics where we have things like the Mass, devotionals, Mother Angelica, uh, conference talks from people like Father Mitch Pacwa, maybe oh. even, would be found on there. That's but what so a lot of people don't realize, we have a separate feed that goes to the Philippines with English language programming throughout the day, and then during the short form messages between the programs, we have native speakers in both English and Tagalog that are addressing the concerns of the society in the Philippines. And then we have the same thing for our brothers and sisters in Great Britain and Ireland. And, you know, there's the referendum coming up uh, regarding abortion in Ireland, so we've got a perfect platform to be able to have local people voicing spots that will tell sure. people about that. So uh, we have all of those playoffs that can be heard on these 350-plus AM, FM stations across the United States. It can be heard at EWTN.com. If you don't have the EWTN app on your smartphone, you need to download that because... Uh, EWTN Radio in English and Spanish, Classics, the Philippines, UK and Ireland, all can be heard from your EWTN uh, smartphone app. Uh, we can be heard on TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, as I said, Sirius XM Channel 130. You have no excuse, Father Mitch, as I've told you before, okay. to not listen to EWTN Radio. All right. Well, then I'll keep listening. I know as I drive around, we, I pick it up all over the country, so it's really good. Jack, thank you very much. Thank you, Father Very Mitch. much glad to have you. We'll be back in about 30 seconds with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Let us now kick right into EWTN Live. Just want to mention that today is the feast of St. Mark the Evangelist. He is especially known as being the amanuensis or secretary to St. Peter. And that St. Mark's gospel is <laughs> mostly based on Peter's reminiscences. And it's very interesting <laughs> that of all the gospels, that is the one that has the uh, greatest number of passages about Peter looking kind of bad. Uh, so Peter was sort of telling on himself a lot. Uh, and then finally, uh, when persecution raged, raged in Rome, St. Mark went over to Alexandria where he preached the gospel there. It is the patriarch of the Coptic church. And he uh, was martyred there as well in the first century. So it's a great celebration. And read the whole Gospel of Mark. It's not that long. You can do it fairly quickly. 
All right, our guest tonight is part of the International Humanitarian Relief Agency of the Sovereign Order of Malta. Uh, these folks work with the most neglected groups or undeserved, underserved areas in countries around the world. They stand beside people who are affected by great poverty, disease, conflicts of various kinds, and natural disasters. He's here to tell us more about the work they do and how we can be a part of it. So please welcome retired Major General Tom Wessels. Tom, thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Delighted to be here. Welcome. Delighted to be here. Great to have you here. And, you know, th this is a great topic to discuss the, uh, the, this work that's being done. Tell us, first of all, a little bit, what is the background history of the, the, the Knights of Malta? And Father the Mitch, thank you to you and to your CEO, Michael Warsaw, and your staff for making this happen. We're delighted Absolutely. to be here. While we're together, you should know that there's about 100,000 staff and volunteers still working around the world in those areas that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, as a name, the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes, and Malta, condensed now to the Order of Malta name. Uh, in the late 11th century, we had a group of monks descend upon Jerusalem, and they set up like a hospice to take care of the sick and the wounded because of the various conflicts that were going on then. Mm -hmm. They continued to do good work. And in 1113, uh, Pope Paschal II actually declared the Order of Malta a religious lay order and a sovereign entity. So as a religious lay order, they were allowed on their own to select their leadership and go forward and to do their mission, taking care of the poor and the sick. But as a sovereign entity, that means they could have diplomatic relations uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. The mission of the Order of Malta in Latin, tuitio fidei et uh, obsequium pauperum, to know nurture and defend the faith, to each of fidei, and at uh, obscurum pauperum, take care of the poor and the sick. That's what we've been doing ever since the 11th century. So this is not a group that was primarily started to go to war and battle and things like that. This was to serve people who had sicknesses, yes. were poor, they came on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, um, and all of those other concerns of that, that time. Exactly. You heard people going and being injured, but you also heard people making the long trek from Europe and elsewhere, getting sick, coming down with the diseases and what have you. Sure. So they set up the hospice, the hospital. So that's the second word, hospitaller, taking care of the needy. Now, because, and I mentioned on radio today because we had a question about yes. it from someone who didn't know that you're, you were going to be the guest tonight. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also emphasize that the notion of a hospital is a Catholic invention. Yes. This is something that Catholic uh, monks and nuns started along with orphanages and universities. We invented those concepts. The oldest Catholic mission, the oldest mission in the world, uh, humanitarian mission, is the Order of Malta. See? You're exactly right. And this is uh, some, and it's not only something that's old, but it is ongoing. No and doubt. People can still take part in it today. No doubt. Now, I, uh, I've seen the uh, pilgrim hostel that is still in Jerusalem. Yes. That uh, is part of your order. But what are some of the other great works? that your order is doing today. Yes, yes. Because y'all don't just sit on your laurels. No, we don't, and that's why I'm here, sitting on my laurel talking to you in the audience. Yeah. Uh, that's laurel. So, we, we were in and out of Jerusalem because of the conflicts. We went to Rhodes, we went to Malta, and then, and frankly, in uh, 1798, when Napoleon took over Malta at that time, we gave up the so-called Hence, we gave up the military mission. Mm -hmm. So now we know our faith, nurture our faith, and if we have to, we'll defend it. But we're mainly taking care of the sick and the poor ever since then. We've been at our headquarters in, 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 in Rome since the middle 1800s. And from around there, we're in 120 countries as an order of Malta doing good, taking care of folks and what have you. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to know, because it's a little different, 
there are three classes in the order of Malta. The first class are fras, like brothers, mm -hmm. all right? Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Most of them do not live in a, uh, uh, an environment like a group of monks do, but they're out as professionals as well, but they're also religious. Mm -hmm. The second order, and I happen to be an order of obedience, it's an extra degree of spirituality and involvement and willingness to do things with the Order of Malta. And most of the 14,000 or so knights and dames we have are knights and dames of the third class, and these are our real volunteers that are out there in those 120 countries. So uh, would the Fras, the, the, the brothers, would they first class, be celibate? Poverty, chastity, obedience. So, that, so like any other religious, yes. they, they don't marry, no. uh, they don't have families, et cetera. That's right. They are f fully devoted and dedicated to the mission. Yes, they uh, do the office every day, they go to mass every day, the mm -hmm. confession. I mean, th these are some great people. And there's mm -hmm. 50 or 60 of them in our order, and we got about 14,000 people, so we'd love to have more first class come into the order. Sure. Obedience steps up and does some of the things that the first class do, but we're doing great missions uh, around the world. Now, and also among the, the, the brothers, are some of them ordained to the priesthood? No, sir. No, no sir. So These are fras. These are fras. These are brothers. All brothers. Now, we do have magistral chaplains around the country for each organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the associations, they have their own chaplains. The whole world, the Catholic world in Malta is going to Lourdes next week. Each of the organizations will bring in their local chaplain and what have you. Mm -hmm. Yet uh, the beat uh, continues. But again, in 120 countries, we're doing lots of things. If you want to go to a website, theorderofmalta.int, and you click down to activities of the Order of Malta, you're going to see four things. You're going to see something called the Holy Family Hospital in Bethlehem, a very, very clean and needed hospital giving uh, maternal and infant care to the mothers and the babies, 99% of whom are not Catholic. It's in the Palestine area. Mm -hmm. It's been there not too far from where Christ was born. You've got an organization called the Global Fund for Forgotten People, where they kind of raise funds for everything in the Order of the Malta. You've got a group of volunteers, mainly in Europe, because this evolved, this organization uh, has evolved uh, volunteer-wise from the German Malteser organization. And there's about 30 or 40 different volunteer groups. And then lastly, which has been around for over 60 years, is Malteser International. This is a non-governmental agency, an NGO, that is actually the humanitarian arm of the Order of Malta. Malteser International, and I'll start my publicity here. There we go, Malteser you know, my International. My dad was a used car salesman. There we go, now there's the Order of Malta. Here. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, Malteser International has got about 100 projects in 25 countries, headquartered in Cologne, Germany. Right? Okay. They've got the headquarters for uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. I happen to head up Malteser International Americas, our headquarters is in New York City, in the same building Cardinal Dolan is, same building the New York uh, Catholic Charities are, the American Association of the Order of Malta is in that building. By the way, there are three associations in the United States, the American, the Federal, and the Western Association, all of whom have great knights and dames who do, do great work. Mm -hmm. Then there's Malteser International Americas. I've got responsibility for 25 countries from Canada, the United States, Caribbean, Central and South America. Our people from San Antonio, God love you, something called Hurricane Harvey, you, you, know, you know the storms came in, that was followed by Irma and, uh, and Maria. We dealt with that uh, last year, but across the water in, in the Gulf of Mexico is Colombia, and we deal with that. So with your permission, I'd love to go through what we're doing in each of those countries. Sure, sure. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's uh, good for folks to have a sense that they, these are concrete needs. And, and one of the things I, I know you had mentioned to me and I want folks to pay attention to is that uh, a lot of times the government agencies in yes. this country and elsewhere will come for some of the big cities, the big disasters, they'll be there. And yet there are other areas that ne get neglected because they're farther away from the big centers, and that's also one of the target areas. Who gets neglected is whom you seek out. Very good, thank you. Yeah, you couldn't have said it, or I couldn't have said it better. That's exactly right. Now, I'll give you an example of Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Yep. Tremendous storm, 54 inches of rain or whatever came in. 
the world descended upon Houston, as they should, large mm -hmm. population, everything. Well, by the way, we have knights and dames in Houston who did a great job and during those initial days and then subsequent weeks taking care of the people. Sure. Catholic Charities came in, FEMA came in, or whatever, even Maltese International came in, but it was a couple days later because we couldn't go to the airport. So you had to go to Austin and then drive in. We got there, we helped, but then we also assessed in the overall area and what we find. We found that Rockport, which is where the storm came in and dumped initially, Rockport was a disaster. Beaumont was a disaster. Victoria was affected. So that's where Maltese International Americas went, took care, gave gift cards out, gave food, gave mattresses, took care of people with hot meals and what have you. Do the same thing. We've been doing the same thing, unfortunately, in Haiti since 2010. They had an earthquake, they had cholera outbreak. They've been dealing with storms. We're in Haiti uh, in three different locations, two outside of uh, Port-au-Prince and I can go in detail what we're doing there, and then one on Valence, the other side. There are other medical activities also in Haiti that are supported by the Order of Malta. And, and so folks understand you know, why Haiti is such an important target for help. I mean, the resources are pretty well gone. You know, they, they've most of their, even their, the wood, the forest, most of that seems to be You've depleted. done your homework, thank you. Um, Haiti is the poorest, and most climate susceptible nation in the Western Hemisphere. Yep. They have, because they don't have latrines, they all have huts they live in, they don't have stoves, so they're gonna cook a fire, they gotta get wood somewhere, so they're either burning the wood on their home or they're getting whatever. We grow mangrove trees down by the ocean. Mangroves are bushes, mm -hmm. which as they grow up, provide great nutrients for the fish and the uh, uh, the little animals and the Birds. fish life, the, yeah. everything that's yeah. down there. Mm -hmm. Now that's healthy, that can be nutrition for the 10,000 families and 50,000 people that live right there. But more so, 300,000 people in that greater Port-au-Prince area can benefit if those people go down, take out those fish, take out those little uh, clams and everything and sell them as a livelihood as well as nutrition. Mm -hmm. Next door in Tabar, we're allowing them and helping them plant community gardens and fruit growing trees. In our country, you might have a fruit tree in your backyard, you get peaches, apples, whatever. They don't know that down there. And so we gotta help them do that, so it's a cultural thing. So that's Haiti, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. It's a devastatingly poor place that has progress. had, you know, since the time they got liberation from the French Empire, they have had lots of dictators and governmental corruption who don't help the folks. So it's, it's a desperate situation. It's a desperate situation, but as a military guy, boots on the ground, I go there to find out what's going on. So I've been there twice within the last year and a half. First time, quite shocking. A lot of places without electricity, a lot of places without a way to have a fire, uh, very few latrines, very few water for sanitation purposes, even if you did use a latrine. Um, Pretty sad. I went back a month and a half ago, many more latrines. We've got a lot more water systems set up for them. We've got more sanitation systems. But frankly, if there's a hole in the ground, uh, culturally and the kids, that's what they do in their schools and what have you. So we've got a lot of work to continue to be done there. We're working with some great uh, corporations and foundations. We get great funding from the country of Germany, the Federal Foreign Office of Germany and Economic Development. We get United Nations funding. Uh, we've gotten some State Department funding, not only for there, but elsewhere in the world. We've got a memorandum of understanding that we're about to sign with the United States uh, Agency for International Development because both them and Malteser International deal outside the United States for the most part. We want to have that particular agreement. That would lead me to Colombia, the other side of the Texas border. Everything that happens to Texas, every storm that comes through, uh, Colombia is the northernmost country there in the Americas. In South America. In South America, and it gets yeah, devastating. You still got Canada, that's farther north. That's the other side, that's exactly right. You're a, you're a good host. And uh, I, I would tell you that every time there's a storm, if you don't really have a home that's above water, you could have six feet of water in your home. Your home may be wood and maybe a tin on the top. You gotta wait for the water to go down. Everything in your home is ruined. I've seen that two years in a row. This year, I actually saw some of the concrete homes we were able to help them build, so at least they got a structure that doesn't go away. So we've helped them do that. We've helped them give fresh water. But by golly, a storm comes in. If they're living right next to the river, it's gonna happen. Yep. Let me share a story. You see this nice little vase. 
uh, and a flower. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, uh, area south of our office, Magdalena, south of Santa Marta, where our office is in Columbia. We went down there again two years in a row, and I saw the improvement in some of the homes, met some of the people. This uh, indigenous person made from the banana tree this nice little vase. And I said, I would love to buy that for you. She said, oh, no, 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 you can have it. No, I want to buy it. So, so I gave her $5. Now, $5 is half what her husband makes when he goes to the banana plantation to work on a day. So this, this is big to them. So I was grateful to do that. I want to take it home and give it to Linda. We can put it on. As I'm walking away, a little girl says, Senor, Senor. She comes up and she gives me, if you can see it, same natural, made out of the same materials and everything, this lovely flower. I mean, just well, it's lovely. It's not made out of plastic. No, this is all this natural stuff that these people do. Mm -hmm. They have nothing. And yet they're able to create and do things such as this. That's Colombia. Mexico City, we provide medication and nutrition to mothers who have been HIV positive so that the kids do not end up getting any of the HIV stuff. Is there a lot of that problem where uh, a number of mothers are HIV positive? Well, you know, we have an ICE program, and uh, last time I was there, there were probably 30 or 40 mothers that were uh, in the program. I don't believe it's as much of a problem as it was maybe 10 years ago mm -hmm. in the HIV world. There's been a lot of improvement, much better medication and, and what have you. Sure. In Peru... And, and you can really prevent you know, w with, with great care. Yes. You can, uh, the, the mother uh, may have it, but she can prevent passing it on to the that's child. A, and that's what education, 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 education. No doubt about without it. Without that help, the child will most likely uh, No doubt about it. it. And that's why we Especially did. during the birth process. Very good. So true. So true. And then in Peru, we provide uh, 5,000 uh, warm meals for the very poor there. Let me jump to something that's in the news, two things in the news. Go back to Colombia. Our office is in northeast Colombia. Further northeast is a country called Venezuela. Venezuela has been a basket case for a number of years. The economy's gone down. Oil price has gone up, and it will help them a little bit, but it's, it's a different regime. People can't get medicine. They can't get food. Last year, in 2017, about a million Venezuelan people came into Colombia. So in addition to us dealing with these five indigenous tribes in Colombia that we're working with, we now have an, a million additional people that need health care, need water, need you know, a, a hygiene, need food nutrition, need, need things to help them build up their resistance. And then, of course, when we engage them, we also try to help have them understand disaster risk reduction so that if something else happens, it would happen. Another thing that's very current is Puerto Rico. Even last week, a good part of the country was without electricity. So that's been months and months and months trying to get them back up on their feet. That's a political subdivision of the United States. We owe it to them to do it, and we're engaged down there uh, with a foundation. Hopefully we'll be getting some hygiene and what have you uh, and, and water to various parts that still need it. Yeah, it's a, it's a com Puerto Rico is a commonwealth, and their citizens are citizens of the United States. They're not immigrants when they come here. They're U.S. citizens. Yeah. I don't think they can vote for the presidency when they're there, but if they are here in the, four, uh, in the 50 states, uh, then they can they have full rights of citizenship. Well, I just don't think that there they can vote. But otherwise, this is part of the United States, yeah. and it's an important installation well, that's I feel, for I feel, our I Navy. It, you know, it's similar to Caribbean, but it is part of the United States. I feel we owe it to them to do the help that we're doing elsewhere sure, uh, around sure. the world. We've helped in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, you know, of these 25 countries, a good number of them uh, have good Malteser operations and good order of Malta operations, and they do great things there, and I'm grateful for the Knights and Dames in that area. So it's really about a couple million people have been able to benefit in various countries around the world. I mean, that, that's the number. Yeah, yeah. In 2017, Malteser International was able to assist two million people around the world. All right, that's us plus all the Asia and the Africa and uh, the uh, the European issues. An another one, you see these people fleeing Africa, and the Italian relief people are out there picking them up in the boats right. and uh, trying to bring them into society, check them, get them healthy. Uh, the Order of Malta and Malteser International help as the immigrants come in and work their way up Europe 
to look for uh, jobs and prosperity to have a life with dignity. Now you can check all this out on our website, www.orderofmaltarelief. Order of Malta Relief. It will tell you about what we're doing in our countries, plus all the other great things that uh, Malteser International is doing, as well as the Order of Malta. Yeah. This is uh, a, a, an important component of the faith because, A, we have both the spiritual and the corporal works the of mercy, mercy yes. that are inherently part of being a good Christian. Yes. Christ our Lord taught us how important the corporal works of mercy are in Matthew 25. When whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. And those are six things that he laid out. The seventh corp uh, corporal work of mercy comes from the book of Tobit, which is to bury the dead. So these are uh, important parts of the Christian life. And this is a, a, an organization composed both of religious who are fu fully vowed as a core, but yes. also these thousands of volunteers yes. who are able to help out just like other groups do. And this is a, a, a great thing. Now, do, do you have to have some special qualifications <laughs> to be able to become a member? I remember, you know, to be a Nider Dame, you're usually asked, and it's usually because you've been active in, in the church and are willing to do the take care of the poor and the sick and defend the faith if need be. We have younger auxiliary, younger people who are professionally doing well, and they also practicing good Catholics and what have you. There's so many good things that we can do, and we bring our Catholic values when we do it. We bring our Catholic values, but we're non-sectarian. We don't proselytize. It doesn't matter what race or religion the people we're helping. You know, the babies in, in Bethlehem being born there, you know, 99%. Or Mo mostly you know, Muslim. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, the people in Haiti, they're not Catholic. And one of the things I mentioned that we tried in underwater uh, hygiene, things such as that, food nutrition security. If we can help enhance their diets and allow them to have a livelihood to put food on their table and maybe sell it. But you mentioned Catholics. Our food nutrition is the Eucharist. If daily or weekly we can experience the, new, the Eucharist, we are benefiting ourselves. Most of the people we assist don't have that option because they're not Catholic. But we're willing to be there and we are there. And uh, I think, you know, uh, along this line, that the, the, your, the group is in the same tradition as Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity, going to the poorest of the poor, not focusing on, you know, of, uh, proselytizing, but on serving the needs in the uh, corporal works of mercy mostly. Yes. Yes. That's it, it, That's one part of the church. So it's not that you're against proclaiming the faith. It's just that that's not your mission. We think we are living our faith by, right. by doing that. Right. And, we're, and that's we're, how sisters, yeah. uh, Mother Tre Saint Mother Teresa and the, her sisters continue to do. This is, yes. uh, I think they see that as a continuity that is one kind of gift in the church that these different communities have, along with all the other gifts. Sure, sure. And that we serve in this, this, this wide variety of ways. Well, the fact that we're a humanitarian organization, we've been doing this for a number of years, we bring core humanitarian standards. A number standards. of years, a thousand years. Well, so true, sorry. We bring core humanitarian it's standards when we're there. Uh, technically, we bring the, the sphere project that we just make sure that we're doing the right thing and make sure and we follow up as any good business uh, would do it. But we continue to evaluate. We continue to ask the stakeholder what their needs are, not what the news says we should be doing, but we go on the ground, we assess, we find, what do you need? Talk to the yes. folks. We don't recreate stuff. We try to reinforce. We work with great partners in Colombia, Abu Dhabi, which is a biological organization, PDPC in Colombia, numerous uh, community-based operations in, in, in Haiti. We're helping them get better. And if we can give them something new, that's fine, but we're not turning them upside down to change them. 
we're assisting them as partners. Oh, sounds like you're not politicians. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a little bit of a break. If you want more information about how you can help the Malteser International Americas, go to their website, which is Order of Malta Relief. Dot org, order of Malta Relief. Dot org, and you'll find uh, lots of things that you can do to help them out and get involved yourself. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. We want to get some of your questions and comments, so please stay with us. Welcome back. I just want to remind you of a hold the date uh, notice for November 3rd of 2018. We will have a family celebration, EWTN family celebration in the wonderful city of Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida. That'll be November 3rd, 2018. And you can find out more about it by going to EWTN.com slash family celebration. It's one day only. It's a good price. It's free. And we'd love to see you come and join us. So please, please uh, come along. Are you ready for some questions? Yes, love to. Thank you. Well, let's get started. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Now, just to keep in mind here now, <laughs> San Antonio is sort of celebrating an anniversary. They're 300 years old this years. year. That's right. But compared to the Order of Malta, <laughs> yes. y'all are pikers. Very good. Very Got good. another 700 years to catch up to. Them. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. well, congratulations to everybody in San Antonio. So, uh, what is your question? I was wondering, how do you reach out to the people? How do you know which people to help? Does the government of each of these countries give you a list? Or how do you know exactly how, who, who needs help and yes. to go about yeah. helping them? Great question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. My daughter-in-law went to school in San Antonio, and there is my uh, granddaughter is named Emma, and you have a Hotel Emma yeah, in San Antonio. Okay, 24-7 uh, operation at the headquarters in Cologne, Germany, 24-7. They're monitoring weather, they're monitoring disasters, they're monitoring conflicts around the world. They know what's going on around the world. Plus, you remember I said we were in 120 countries. We have diplomatic relationships with those countries. So hopefully we get the door opened to come in and assist, whether it's in the Philippines or in Europe, Italy, or in the, in the Caribbean or whatever. That's how we monitor that, our humanitarian staff. Now, would you also have something of a um, uh, diplomatic presence at the United Nations. We do have an observer to the United Nations uh, who happens to be a Venezuelan, by the way, <laughs> in New York City, very interesting. Now, great guy, I will see him on Friday when I go to New York to our headquarters. Uh, we also have uh, observer missions in, in uh, Paris and in Belgium and a couple in the, in the Far East. So yes, we're out there. We also have papal annuncios and the Order of Malta has ambassadors that they appoint to each of the countries. I'll be meeting with the, uh, the new ambassador to Haiti uh, in next month in New York as well. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, worth knowing that that's part of that 
uh, establishment by Pope Paschal That's that okay. made this possible. Sovereign entity. That's exactly, exactly right. So it, uh, uh, this was true of some of the other groups of uh, knights, uh, some of which no longer exist, like the uh, Knights Templar, but they could have that kind of diplomatic status, sure. and, and you still do. We are a survivor, no doubt. Better than they did. Yeah. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Swan Hill in Victoria, Australia. Swan Hill, Swan Hill. in Victoria, Australia. You win the Long Distance <laughs> Award tonight. I'll take the prize. Good to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. And I've actually been out that way in Australia. It Open a, invite. Yeah, it's, it is. It's beautiful. And your question, ma'am? So my question, you know, we're talking about Haiti and how poor it is and bad government. And I'm just wondering how far you can go with, you know, a government's bringing countries down all the time, you know, working against a government and you're trying to help. Yeah. How can they improve long term? Well, again, going back to our headquarters, we have program managers for each country, and they, in effect, have the relationship you know, that you need to get into the country. We have staffs there, a good number of them are local. <coughs> the partners we work are local, so they know the connection. Do we work with the government for the most part? No, we don't. We bring our talent, uh, we bring our resources, we're fortunate to get from donors and other people. We set up what we need to do and we go out and do our job. The diplomatic people, the ambassador, I'll let them deal with the government. Uh, the papal nuncio that I met with uh, uh, twice in Haiti knows uh, a lot of those people, but that's not necessarily the quickest way to get things done. Yes, yes. So this is, uh, but, but there are other ways in which you can get in contact with the right folks and take yes, care of it. Yes, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. Okay, okay good. Thank you. And we have another question. Let's see. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Shirts, Texas. I'm Shirts, Texas, Texas which San Antonio. Is not too far from San Antonio sure. at all. As, as, as a lot of folks don't know. Of course, we know the Hispanic uh, uh, settlements, the early uh, friars and uh, Spanish settlers that came there, but also big communities of Germans. Germans. Uh, Fredericksburg and uh, yeah. Short, short country, good. All sorts of folks. So, so your question. A question is, uh, what has the Order of Malta been able to do for the earthquake victims in Mexico in the past year? Yes, thank you. If where, you first of all, tell us where that earthquake was. Okay, two locations, one just right outside of Mexico City, and then further out about an hour and a half. I happened to be there, went on a Lady of Guadalupe pilgrimage, did that, which was great, and then I met with the Order of Malta in Mexico, in Mexico City. I visited uh, a school that had been pretty well 50% affected by the earthquake. They also had a senior living system uh, that was affected. Their headquarters was affected a little bit, so I'm familiar with that. We provided some initial assistance to them, plus the Order of Malta in Mexico uh, has done that. Uh, while I was there, they had a, uh, a secondary quake, which caused the hotel, the hotel keys to, to lose their magnetic. So everybody had to get issued new hotel keys. So I witnessed firsthand the, uh, the effects of the earthquake in Mexico City. One of the most famous disasters of the past uh, generation was the great tsunami that began oh, yes. in Indonesia with an earthquake yes. and then went all across yes. the Indian Ocean. Were you all involved in any Malteser of that? International, Asia was, Europe and Asia were then. I was not engaged at that time, of course I was America's, but they were, and they can still talk about it, you can probably find some information uh, on our, our, our website. Yeah, yeah, because uh, cause I, 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 a friend of mine's brother was, uh, a doctor who was on vacation in Thailand, but uh, became, of course, himself very involved in yeah. helping with the relief. I will be going to Thailand and uh, in uh, Cambodia in uh, at the end of June, so maybe I have a follow-on answer for you. Sure, sure, great. I have another question from our studio yes, audience, ma'am. Ma where are you from? San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio. And uh, the 300-year-old city. All, you're celebrating this all year long, aren't you, down there? Yes, we are. And uh, 
this week actually is Fiesta Week in San Antonio. That's an annual celebration to celebrate the victory of, uh, of Texas freedom from Mexico. There you go. I also urge if you haven't been, go to San Antonio at Christmas time. The river walk is fantastic. So your question, ma'am. In, in what way do you in, engage young people to help with the Order of Malta in these disasters or in yes. whatever way? Yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, in the Order of Malta, over the recent number of years, we've had what we call auxiliary. These are people who are maybe too young to initially become knights or dames. Maybe they haven't been in the professional world or their occupation long enough, but they're practicing Catholics. They want to get engaged. Uh, I'll give you an example because I'm from Atlanta, what the auxiliary has done for a number of years. They make blankets. They make blankets for the malads that we take to Lourdes every year. So in Lourdes, frankly, you don't know whether it's going to rain, sleet, or snow, or be 80 degrees. You never know. But the sick people have these blankets, which we've been provided to them. A second thing that younger people do, they're better at pulling and pushing the carts in Lourdes as we move everybody around. So there's, there's, there's room for uh, the auxiliary and younger people. And if I can get the volunteer organization going in the United States like we have in Europe, there'd be a lot more reason to get the younger people involved. I, I think, too, that um, th there are a couple trends that are very important. One, around the country, you do have lots of high school and college students who use their spring vacation or even part of their summer vacation to go and serve projects. very poor people in uh, various projects. Yes, yeah. And this is a very important thing. Are there the things that, would, that some of these auxiliaries would be able to do along that line? Yes, and a lot of people raise their hand, they want to do something, and then they find out that it's their nickel that gets them from point A to point B, and then they got to... You know, because it's not funded for the most part, because right. it's a volunteer organization. And at the stages of the career they're in, they can't leave their family or their little kids or, or whatever. Well, they are kids and they don't well, have anybody some of, to you know, begin with. It, below 35 years of age, let's say, that they're not as established as some of the other sure. people. But it is a great world when people want to do things and we wish we can get to that point where we can engage everybody that wants to get engaged. Yeah, and because I, uh, I, I know some of the schools will oftentimes have the young people get help from their parishes for a mission trip. And I think these are the kinds of things. If the clergy of America can allow Malta and Malteser to tell the story, I think that might be a great possibility. Now, we do have the younger folks that go and take care of the handicap a couple places around the world. I think this year they're going to London. I think last year they were in Lebanon. And those that raise their hand and want to get involved with the whole world descends upon there and, and helps with the, uh, the disadvantaged youth that show up there. Sure. Very sure. nice program. Yeah. Very nice program. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have a caller. Hello, John. Hello, Father Mitch I'm from Ohio. Good to have you back, John. And your question. <laughs> uh, the Malta order, very interesting. I was wondering if uh, the order of Malta ever gets assistance or joins together with, like, secular Franciscans or orders that have their third orders, and I'll hang up. Okay, good question. The fact that we're a Catholic order, it benefits us as we have relationships with archdioceses and dioceses and local churches. In, in, um, recently in, in Puerto Rico, two churches stood up right away. Uh, the delegation in the Order of Malta in, in Puerto Rico was able to go there and we set up assistance and, and, and what have you. So around the world, we get involved with the clergy. Now, whether you get into the tertiary, whether it's uh, Franciscans or Benedictines or, or whatever, we're willing if, if they happen to be, have an expertise and they, can, and they can show up. I don't know that we have anything specifically that engages them other than being a general volunteer. What about some of the other non-governmental organizations? There are lots of them out there. Um, do you do much cooperation with them? It's all partnership is what, what we do. Having been a past Grand Knight of the Knights of Columbus, I know what Knights of Columbus does. Uh, involved in Legatus in Atlanta, I know what, uh, what they do. Around the world, if it's Catholic, we can do different things. And we'll work with, uh, there's a great Amish community in Pennsylvania 
that's on the first moment of the disaster, they're there. We'll work alongside those people. Again, we're non-secretary, we don't care. We're out there to help the people. So mm -hmm. if they can bring some value added, we'll be there right there with them. And one of the cool things about the Amish is that they know how to build things without high technology, yes. which when you go to some of the <laughs> poor countries, yeah. that's your situation. If you don't have electricity, you know, how are you going to do it? Uh, but the Amish don't have electricity, they and it. they get her done. They get to it. I was looking at your sculpture here. <laughs> you yes. wonder where that may have come from. Yes. Well, well I, I can tell you that's from Bethlehem. There you go. There Lovely. It is. Yeah, that, that they make those over there. Now, um, this is something we, we, it's, it's great to have a sense of people looking for an outlet. That's probably what you do, an outlet for being able to do some of the corporal works of mercy. A lot of folks do want to help, but they don't know how to channel it. This is one of the services that I think that you all provide. If given the opportunity to tell the story like I've done here today in various parishes or dioceses mm -hmm. or whatever, more and more Catholics will understand what it is that we do and more and more people can be attracted to be volunteers or maybe eventually even be knights or dames of the order. But frankly, in the United States, we're a relatively new operation. You know, been around since 1100s in the, in the other parts of the world, but in the United States, you know, 60 some years. We've got work to do to spread the word. And, and, and again, I love all the organizations that I've been in that are Catholic. I happen to be very much involved in the Order of Malta. I'd love to have the word, the branding get out there as we get more people involved. Thank you for asking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, when you think that, uh, you know, San Antonio is only 300 years, but it is, uh, you know, almost 60 years older than the United States. So mm -hmm. this is a fairly young country, especially compared to, you know, the, the, the Knights of Malta. So you've got this um, very old community of charity and support in doing corporal works of mercy that, you know, is reaching out now to relatively young countries like the United States and the other nations of the Americas. Canada. And we never know when the disaster, we never know when there's when fragility, so people are going to be pressured, you know, the, the immigrants or the refugees, you know, God help us with what's going on in Syria and all the work that we're doing up there in, in, in Iraq and you've seen in the Mediterranean. What we do in the Americas is needed, but we're all around the world in 120 countries trying to do some good. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, pretty important to, to see that this work um, is where you're looking to find Christ in these other people. We may not be evangelizing with explicit words, but one, a, a key element of Matthew 25 is that whatever you did to the least of my brethren, you did to me, and you're finding Christ in a lot of people who all around them they see is catastrophe. Yes. And where is God? And what, and you're looking for Christ in them, in their catastrophe. Over the years, the Order of Malta has had a saying, we take care of our lords, the sick and the poor. From the earliest days, they would bathe the sick and the wounded. They would serve them meals on silver platters, mm -hmm. elevating them, trying. They're looking at them as a Christ figure, our Lord, mm -hmm. the sick and the poor. So that was a very good thing to, to bring up. Yeah, again, that is a, a component of Catholic charity throughout, not the, just the organization Catholic Charities, but you know, you, you read some of the saints, St. Saint Elizabeth of Hungary and others, they would not only wash the clothes of the poor, but perfume them and serve them on their best, you know, uh, flatware and yes, such. Yes. This, it, because part of the issue is in recognizing Christ inside the needy person, you also want to be well aware of the dignity God has given them. And that's partly what Mother Teresa's sisters sure. and you all are doing 
This is a, a very important component. Too often, the poor are disregarded and as you know, the unimportant people. That's not what you're doing at all, is it? We're all children under God. And I tell people uh, when we go to Lord, frankly, it's the one time every year I give. The rest of the year I'm taking, I'm asking, I'm trying to accomplish mm -hmm. things. But you go to Lord and you take care and you spend time with the unfortunate, maybe disabled or sick or whatever. That's a, that's a nice feeling. And, and yes. they benefit from it as well. And the companions that come along with them, they need some rest because they're spending all that time with their particular loved ones. And when you think also of the experience of people going through catastrophes, how often they will say, well, where's God? You know, why did God let this happen to me? And I, from my own life, I generally find that that's not a good question. I can give you I a God story. Well, it, you, it's, on, it's on our website. Yeah, well, uh, I, I was just going to say that it's not good to, answer, to ask, where's God? Why did he abandon me? So yeah. much as for it is important for us sure. to go out there and become the answer to that. Nice. God is here when we're serving. Yes. So what was the, the story? I, again, going back to Colombia and the influx of people from Venezuela, there was a couple as children, they left Colombia to go to the prosperous Venezuela at the time. Many Which years, used to be very, yes, very well to do. Many years later, six children, each of them had lost their jobs. There was nothing. The father went back to Colombia to look for work. Mother stayed there with the six children. Over time, all she had to give her children was water. And one of them began to get very, very <coughs> deathly ill. She went to a parish priest. And the parish priest said, something good is going to happen. A day later, her husband called, who she hadn't heard from in months, in Colombia, and says, come on down. <laughs> come back over to Colombia. So uh, with a chair and a blanket and six children, she went back into the, month, uh, into the country of Colombia, met up with her husband. Now they're getting the care that we, as Malteser International, can hopefully give them health-wise, food nutrition, water, hygiene, maybe some medication uh, if they need it. There's some God in that. There's some God. Oh, the yeah. parish priest said something good's going to happen. And yeah, go. yeah the, I'm sure he gave her hope. And, you know, you, you take a look at a situation like Venezuela. On one hand, the government is trying to do everything. Now, that's, that's, that's the ideal of socialism, that they want a socialist system where all the people are taken care of. That's the promise. But they don't know how most socialists, I don't know, many socialist countries, where they know how to do that. We have to be people who are willing to do this, not out of political theory, but out of the love of the Christ. Need, the need is there. The need is there. And, and unfortunately, Venezuela is not accepting any aid. So the people there are, are, are suffering, but the people who are leaving also need the help, whether they're coming into Colombia or, or elsewhere. So this is what we exist for, to allow people to live a life with dignity mm -hmm. and to, to get them good health care, to get them some water, get them hygiene, try to prepare them for the next disaster, and there will be some disaster. So the our website, orderofmultirelief.org, tells you about these stories. If you want to sign up for uh, our on-the-spot newsletter about every three weeks, you'll find out what's going on in our part of the world. Mm -hmm. Just fill it out. We'll be more than happy to get that to you. And, you know, when I think about that, so much of what we hear in news stories is bad news. Mm -hmm. But this is a newsletter about the good news that is being done to show charity I've seen to it. those. I've seen need. it in the countries that I've been in. Sure. All our directors that have been in various countries, our executive director who's been all around the world doing it, they see it. This is why we're engaged in the, the work we are. Humanitarian with Catholic values, taking care of all sorts of people, no matter race, creed, color. Yep, that's a great thing. I remember when Archbishop Sheen was on TV, mm -hmm. uh, he also did all kind of the charity work. We have no regard to race, color, or creed. We just um, were there to help. 
I want to thank you very much thank you so for much. being with us, uh, appreciate it, and letting us know that this very ancient work is continuing in the world. And I want to be able to extend a blessing to all of you as well. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and fill you with His love and charity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you know, we can bring this kind of good news about the good things happening and all the other programs that are going on here at EWTN only because you, this network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable <laughs> bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.